So what is the problem with test it? Seems up. That, that's essentially what you have to do. So don't see what it is there. Now, I wish I could see it like that. The technology is not advanced to show me <laughs> the depth, the width, and height of the line. You can only see the height and depth, right? the width. But the depth is not there, but the seat is still dark, which is not the subject for today. We'll see what it is for the topic of another day. So, there is a tested way. For some of you, maybe the first time you've seen it, how many of you have not seen this picture? No one has ever seen it. Don't be scared. Tell the truth. Everybody has seen this picture. Now that you've seen the test today, tell me what is my heroin. Excellent. They write that. Remember, we have to be very precise. Left side is the right arm. Left arm. Let's give it a bed now. All right, so what is the X-ray? When we do X-ray beam to the body, we look at the summation of densities, right? There are four densities that I listed here. One is air, which will have the darkest shadow. So what are the air-containing structures in the body? And sometimes the air trapped. This air is air trapped. Everybody knows that, right? People swallow air, you pass air from above and below. So, yeah, then the next density is fat tissue. And we have a lot of that in the mid south, right? And then the next one, lots of tissue under the skin. So it is next density. Then we have soft tissue, like the muscles, right? And the denser structure in the body is what? Bones. Anything denser than that you see next day? Yes. For the problem, right? So those are the five densities. And the lesson we are talking here, that you look at the density and try to recognize what structure it could be. So if you are X-ray is going to the heart, which of these three density you can pick up? Soft tissue, right? If you are going to the lung, which tissue you could be careful answer if you don't answer? Going to the bones, which one you could pick up? Maybe between air and breath? Because lung is not devoid of any tissue, there's some tissue. Most of it is air. Most of it will look like here, right? But it could look somewhat here because there is connective tissue, alveolar tissue, blood supply, capillary, capillary. Put me on that. Okay, move on. We're going to look from the front. Look from the side, right and left, and from the back. Remember, we are trying to make you a clinician, an observer, and a person who will assess the patient before looking at the x ray. Do it again. Looking from the front. Where is that zero? What is the call? Everybody tell me, you put your finger on the wrong one. Is that what happened? Supra, sterna, fossa, not, you know, supra sterna depression. It is above the sternum. What is the name of the of the of the breast bone? No, sternum, supra sterna, above the sternum. Okay, it's still free. Let's look from data, super standard notch. All right. What is this one? Now we're going to go through an exercise. Watch me carefully. Watch me carefully. I'm going to take this out. What we're going to do is we're going to put our index finger, if you're right handed, right handed finger, left handed, and we're going to place it here. The movement I want you to do is you're going to slide the skin over the bone. And you keep going down. Two movements. One is slide the skin over the bone, and second, you progressively go down. Here we are. So I started just below the suprasternal notch, right? And I am doing this, and I'm going down until you feel a protuberance. Go down. You go above it, you know, you know that it's protuberance. Okay, so then if this is the upper part of the sternum, I'm looking to the side, you can sign on that. You know? You know what? This is the skin. It's something like this. Some of you will feel it, some of you may not feel it. But you have to be able to look at it for this particular. This is the rough. Okay, if you cannot feel it after the class, look at one of the friend colleagues trying to see. Next time you see a patient, right? So, a 
again slide the skin over the bone keep going down until you feel the elevation you go down until you don't see the elevation and that coming with coming back to coming back to so what is that indicates what does that indicates and you put your sternum joint right breast bone has three parts what are the three parts manubrium body and xiphoid process so there is a junction okay let's draw it this is what we're talking about and here's the body right and then we take our tip to the cartilage so part one part two part three we look into one way at this point the nucleum the body and the stomach right what is the significance of that that's what the second rib joints remember the ribs are joining first rib and that is where the second rib joins our goal is to identify the second rib by going through this process we identify the and it will start on a turn of the angle of Bruni. Angle of L E W I S. Write down. You find it in your book. Angle of Bruni. That's what it is called. This is the angle. Angle of Bruni. Identify that, and that will tell us where the second ring is. Right? So that's where the number two is. And that's the second ring. It corresponds to the same horizontal plane as number one. Right? So what did you find? On this protuberance, and we're going to go laterally, right or left, and we'll find the second degree. But I don't want you to spend an hour on that. The drive is good. If you feel it, try it in another setting. But it is the purpose of it is to identify the second degree joining the manubrium sternum joint. Right? right. And the rib below will be the third rib. Now we're going to draw the clavicle. Clavicular run from here to here. We will find mid clavicular point halfway. And we will draw a vertical line for the mid clavicular line. And we are going to go over the third rib, and that's our point of interest. So, step one identify supraternal fossa for north is zero. Step two identify the protuberance and call it the junction of the nucleum and sternum. The nucleum and sternum. And call that rib go laterally to the rib, that's your second rib. You go one rib down, and that's your third rib. And put it on right side or left side, identify the mid clavicular point, and that's where we're going to go. Now, this is our chest x ray of <coughs> your right and this element of the chest on the left. So, if we look at this picture here, how many pairs of ribs do we have? This is your textbook knowledge 12 pairs. Right? Rib comes in pairs, right? First rib, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and eleven, twelve. So we split in a minute. There are twelve pairs of rib, right? And they connect forward and anteriorly with the sternum. And we bring body cyber process, right? We see the endocrine sternal angle is joining the second rib. The challenge is how to find that in the X. Go to the X-ray, and this is the anterior rib. This is the posterior, and this is where the manubrium sternal angle is. And you will be and go one rib down, and that's the third. Okay, that's what we're going to identify. So why do you say error of here? Which rib is that? First rib, posterior. Are you going crazy? Posteriorly coming laterally, and this is the anterior part. Second rib is very close to the first rib. Lateral, anterior, third rib, posterior, lateral, anterior, right. So this major structure is the anterior third rib. Have I lost you guys? Okay. So yes. Good. All right. So tell me what the arrow. What is the tip of the arrow on the right side? Anterior or posterior? How about the rib above it? That's posterior. So let's learn something. On the chest x ray, <laughs> on the chest x ray, the rib that is looking at you, looking at you is the posterior. Posterior rib has more calcium, 
more ready to understand, more beautiful message. The anterior ribs are cartilage in front, so the, the thick cortex is faded. Also, the chest x is taken from the back, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you did not quite master this, it will not be an issue for the lecture, but those who did, teach it to others. Okay, so this is posterior first rib, second posterior rib, and the second third rib, posterior, lateral, and here. So this is the point of interest. Okay, now this is a 30 year old man who came to you with right sided chest pain and dyspnea for 24 hours. What do you see? Excellent. How do you guys learn this? That's good. That's good. Okay, good. That's good. So the right arm, right arm does not have the air. This is the border of the collapsed lung. You see the line? This is the collapsed lung. It's collapsed medially close to the midline. Very easy. So this is a pneumocrat. Is it tension or not tension? How do you know? Some say tension, some say no. This will answer. Is it shifted to the opposite side? The pressure builds up with the collapsing down with the large pneumothora. The pressure is going to push the trachea, push the heart to the other side. So, this is the tension pneumothora. What's the treatment? It's an emergency. <coughs> is now. Okay. Short of testing, we can do a bedside procedure. Pneumothora. Decompression. Decompression. You can call it intercostal catheter. Okay, you guys are ahead of me, so you can say intercostal catheter. I'll call it intercostal catheter, I'll call it pneumotar, foot catheter, wing catheter. There's so many versions in the market. The bottom line is an intercostal catheter, smaller than a chest tube, does not need a surgical doctor, does not need a pulmonary clinic or your stomach, can be done by you. Trust me. Trust me, I'm going to be ready. But you yeah. can. Yeah. Some of you will. Or by internal medicine doctor. It's life saving and it has to be done within seconds and minutes and not wait until the thoracic surgeon arrives. So, insertion, emergency insertion, and that's the catheter. So, what happened to the lung? Before, after it expanded, right? Okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about the front. I will summarize it at the end what we learned from the front of the field. Let's go to the lateral. What procedure we do on the lateral chest wall? That's why you do chest pain, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to count the ribs. Here we say this is my second rib corresponding to this protuberance, right? And the one below is third, and the one below is fourth. And I keep going down, and laterally I got fifth, I got sixth. That's how you do it. There's no separate way to count the first rib in the axilla because it's too much tissue. So we go from the front and keep on going down third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, sixth rib. Okay? Let's go there. So here we are. So you are basically going with that for reverse, right? Second rib. By the way, whatever rib you feel in front first, that's the second rib also. So I don't want to get Because you will not be able to palpate the first rib. Why? It's under the table. First rib is hidden underneath the collarbone. So you're not going to palpate. We're going to have to palpate the second rib, but this is a more sure and certain way. I go from the angle, second, and third. And then I keep going fourth rib until I reach the tip of the sixth rib. So, where is the This is the axilla, right? Anterior and posterior axillary line, anterior axillary line, you know, the muscle fold of the axilla, front and back. In between the two is mid axillary line, and that's the arrow. So, where is the arrow pointing to? About the sixth, right? About the sixth. Yeah, that's what it is. First rib, second rib, third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib. Right? So, what was the number of rib when we put the intercostal catheter? Three, right? And now we're doing three plus three, six. So, most of the chest tube will be inserted over the six rib. Over the six rib. Right? I like the intercostal space. Yes. Yeah. It will be fifth intercostal space. So, if that was your answer, that was correct. It is six. Space is fifth. Why? First is the first space, second space, third space. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. What is the diagnosis? You guys surprised me on the last one. Surprise me again. 
Which side is the normal, right or left? Yeah. Is it darker or white? What could it be? Let's say for cats. Hemothorax, they're not going to get What's the generic name for it? When you have a homogeneous, the Greeks have homogeneous density. The Greeks have homogeneous density. Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. It's a equal density and it has an upper curvature. Which is characteristic of? Plural effusion. This is that plural effusion. Then it could be blood. Blood pool through this, pass pool through this, or just exited with fluid or transmitted with fluid from heart failure. But your answer will be <coughs> plural effusion. Remember, I'm going to test you at the end of my lecture. Right? I don't know what the prize is, so I didn't make a prize. I'll find something. <laughs> All right, so call it large left plural effusion. Do we that? Okay, what do we do with it? That's the testing. That's the real thing. Not the international gatherer that you can put on the bedside and scan things and eat it. It will require some drinking, some sterilizing, bringing some skull pad and knife and lidocaine. And you have this package, you open up surgical ray. This is the incision made over the six feet most of the time. Could be six feet, could be seven feet, depending on what are you handling, what are you dealing with. And that's where the chest tube should go. And it goes to blood. So the ones of the blood is tight. That patient was a patient of Kumati. Who is Kumati? And Kumati. That's a patient, real patient that I took care of. Of the Kumati. And then there, and when we put the needle into the blood, so the chest tube, blood came out and then the bamba went up. But this is after removing the fluid. Okay, I need to move on. Any question on the letter B? Chest tube. Let's go posteriorly. What, can, what is the posterior chest wall? That's what is the <coughs> procedure. <coughs> what procedure do you do with that? Intercostal gatherer insertion, chest tube insertion, what do you want to do with that? Thoracic <laughs> this. This is more common than the first two. You do it, it's an internal medicine procedure. It's a procedure for a people's are provided. What you're going to do is anesthetize the skin, go to two centimeters and you have to do it. So let's talk about that. This is the line. It is called scapular line, right? We talk about mid clavicular line. We talk about mid axillary line, but it's not mid scapular. Why? The scapula is not a homogeneous structure. It's an irregular shape plane, right? So we take the lowest point of the scapula, draw a vertical line, and that's the line we're going to insert the needle. How high, how low, depends on how much fluid. The small fluid diffusion, you're going to go here. The large diffusion, you can go here. But most of the time, we'll be shooting for the 93. Now, how do we locate 93? It will be very difficult to travel from the front and say, hey, my angle of fluid. And second, third, it's going to be tough. So on the bed, there is a rib that could be complete. The three rib, what rib could that be? How many pairs of rib we have? Well, the letter three is possible in most patients. Okay, again, if you can go up to the class, check with each other or check with the patient, you'll be able to tell them that in my own right now, the chief of the 11th three is possible. Two leaves that are three leaves, they don't connect with the costal margin. The letter can 12. The 12 is too short, too deep. So, the letter three is possible. So, if I can complete my letter three, I can complete my 10th three and 9th three. Most of the time, we're looking for the ninth rib. So we say, third rib, mid clavicular line. Complete. Sixth rib, mid axillary line. And ninth rib, scapular line. We don't use the word mid because I explained to you, vertical line to the inferior of the scapula is scapular line, right? So we're going to repeat those three for me. Somebody volunteer. What's the landmark for intercostal catheter and insertion potential in the Third rib, mid clavicular line, right through that, whatever the problem is. Just you. Six rib, thoracic density. Scapular line, nine rib, or maybe eight if it is large. It's too small than it was what? It's going to be small, understand? So, by the doing it, right? Do we understand? All right, three, six, and nine. 
there with you always in third or sixth or ninth? It is uh, generally I would say third is almost fixed. Okay. It's safest. Sixth depends. Some people will go fifth, some people will go okay. seventh or plus minus one. Ninth, it could be plus minus one or even two. There's a general rule that this is a general rule, and it's very helpful to remember. Right? Okay? If I have a huge floor division, write this one. If I had none, guys, I would count the reads and show you, but I'm afraid I've run out of time. That would be good. One. <laughs> this is the posterior cross three. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. This is the ninth read, right? Mm -hmm. If I don't want to go too low, I may be able to count the speed. I want to go to the speed <coughs> because my fluid allows me to go one space higher. Thank you, Craig. question, yes. Now, it is the most common. I can go one after that. All right. First is being done. First is it. Right. So, who's going to tell the <coughs> procedures we have run? Volunteer. The procedures we run. Name the procedure. Uh, name? Uh, Margaret? Okay. Tell me about this procedure. The name of this procedure. Uh, oh, the word is it 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 Chest x-ray, you give away a lot, you sacrifice a lot. That's one of the 
I'm getting to this lecture. That's my best test between PA and lateral. Or would the compromise because my patient cannot have the full x ray, but I would do structures behind the diaphragm, like a pneumonia at the base of the lung for a small pulmonary fusion. Okay, area missed by the chest x ray, portable. It would be a portable chest x ray. You can't see what is behind the heart. We already say you can't see what is behind the diaphragm, right? You can't see what is behind the heart, and you cannot see what is behind the Trachea or breast bone. You can't see what is behind the structure. So you count the one behind the diaphragm, behind the heart, behind the trachea, 30% of the structures are not seen. So that's one of the lessons learned today. The portable chest x ray can be structural finding behind the diaphragm, behind the heart, behind the sternum, in the medicine. And that will do maybe more lectures in the mouth. Okay, I think we can understand that and retain that knowledge. All right. All right, so we need both PA and lateral view, right? So that we can see what is behind the diaphragm, what is behind the heart and behind the sternum. One, two, three. What is this about? We put a map after all. So this is an analogy in my professor of medicine gave me two years ago. Very nice for chest x ray. It's not a perfect analogy. What's the analogy? The heart is in the center, the cupid heart, right? And the lung is the air in the cave. The airway is not there, but it's supposed to be air coming into the center. And the diaphragm is here. So I teach five things you do when you look at chest x Start with take your breath. Where does it go? Let your bronchial air. That's one. Look at the airway. Is it in the center? Right here? Is it looking regular or compressed or narrow, etc.? Branches to right main bronchus, left main bronchus, upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe, as much as you could guess. The experience is no more. So, first is A for airway. So, this time, A is the first letter of the alphabet of the five things you want to do. Airway. Then, it doesn't go, B is not there. But, B is the lung. Second is, look at the lungs. Lung field has to, is there a pneumonia? Is there a, you know, lattice? Is there a tumor? C will be. I look between the two lungs, the medicinal structures. Is there an enlargement of the heart? Is there a, is an aneurysm of the aorta? Right? The widening of the medicinal. C is the plural. What is between the lung? Number three. Number four is what is beyond the lung or wrapping the lung. What wraps the lung? Plural. Plural makes a wrapping around the lung. What is there a plural? And it's a U turn and makes another layer to the internal wall of the chest or the parietal plural. Right? Is there a plural? And then diaphragm and everything beyond. So who's going to tell me the five things you're going to look under the chest? Test? Five fingers. Airway, lung fills, between the lungs, within the lungs, heart and medicina, pleura, which is surrounding the lung, and everything below and beyond. And it could be a neck mass, you can pick it up. It could be an axillary mass, you can pick it up. It could be a breast lump, you can pick it up. So beyond those four, right? Can you use that as a systematic way of looking at chest x ray? Follow this pattern. Here are they. Airway, lungs, heart, medicina, heart and medicina, pleura and diaphragm and everything beyond. All right. Now this is one of the chest x-rays. Now in this classroom, I cannot teach you everything. This but let's start with the A. What does it look like? Try to air column. Is it center or the knee? How do we know? This is how we know that we have the spinous process. See that? The teardrop. The spinous process is falling in the center of the diaphragm. The distance from this structure from, to this structure from this to this is equal on both sides. What is this structure? You all know? Spinous process. If you go up and read your spine, if you're examining the spinous situation, you can know those prominent. What are those? So, spinous process. Unless there is a scoliosis, that should be the marker of the middle. You follow me? So, spinous process should fall in the center of the head. And that's the best way to know if the x ray is rotated or not. You follow me? All right. <laughs> okay, good. So, spinous process in the center of the head. This is the left main bronchus. This is the right hand side. I don't know what he's talking about. 
not. Because you drive very good. Yes, right? Like five years, after ten years, it's not five years. It'll take time. It'll take time. But after airway, we know that the right and left arm. Which arm is right? Why? Right. Heart. The development of the lung, the heart takes the space of the medial part of the left arm, making it about 55, 45. Don't write it down. Right lung is about 55 percent, and left lung is about 45 percent of the air to brush supply. So it's about 10 percent right. Got it? All right. Now, so the lung looks quite good, right? Now, in order to know the lung is good, we need to see the structure that the sharp border, the upper part of the trachea, or the nose, left heart border, right heart border. What is it said to Costal strength. Costal is both real and the strength is that. What is this said? Cardio strength. Easy. Costal very real to diaphragm, cardio strength is hard to diaphragm. This angle is cardio angle, cardio angle on the left side, less costumeric angle, they are sharp. So the lung looks good. What's the heart? Between the lung and the heart. The heart looks good, right? The aortic now looks normal and everything in the medicine looks clean and sleep is good. How about the throat? Probably there is nothing wrong with the diffusion, you see that, right? White out, it's the carpenter. I showed you throat diffusion, right? Earlier. So and how about beyond? That one looks good. Look at the gastric action. Is the PAV or FEV? PAV. PAV, upright. You can say upright in formula letter. Just in the word upright, so remember upright standing for upright in. Upright in, right? Okay, good. Yes. All right. This is the fun part. Truly, this is the fun part. But because of the time, don't have to go far. Okay, so how many times do you have? Can we have one more? Yes. Give me a number. They were next to me. Why do we do that? That's where all trauma, certain severe diplomata, the eating wheeler, and about the boat. The lung is crushed, the chest is crushed, the surgeon should save your life, you spend the lung, cut it off, right? But you're right, you were next to me, right? But two lungs, which lung, how many lobes we have in the right lung? What are they? Excellent, upper middle lobe, upper middle lobe. You're better than my resident. That's a superior lobe, inferior lobe. You still have to use the name Margaret Schubert, right? Not many, but something like that. So call the right name. Call the right name. Upper middle lower lower. How about the left arm? Upper. The one is the middle one. It's not there. The heart has to be up, right? So because they are hard here, there is no second vision. The two vision on the right lung, the major vision and minor. Easy. Major minor. Major minor. You can also call them. Major fissure, you'll see that in a minute. Or black fissure that separates the upper part of the lung from the lower part. On the left side, there's only one fissure. We come into it. Let's get the fissure right now. So, how many lobes on the left lung? Upper and lower. Upper, middle, and lower. Upper, lower. Similar nomenclature. Upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. Medium on the right, there's no middle on the left. You call this. You see the shape? What does it look like? Tongue shape called lingula. Lingula, linga language is tongue, right? So lingula is the name of the part of the upper lobe that is not separated by fissure. But to designate the name, we call the corresponding part of the left lung similar to the medium <coughs> lobe of the right lung as lingula. Taking a profession, I can use your brain a lot. All right, so on this view, you already got your right upper middle lower lobe, left upper lower lobe. Can you tell me what the upper lobe it is and what it ends? Oh, you need to know what the fissure is. So that's your major fissure. Major fissure is divides the lung on the right side, it's on the back, so you cannot see it coming to the back, coming around, around, around. Into Upper and middle lobe and lower lobe. The upper and middle is divided by the minor fissure, right? Mm -hmm. Is so the right lung is divided into three lobes, first by the major fissure, also called a light fissure. Why? Because it is light, right? Mm -hmm. And and when I learned the minor fissure will separate the upper and middle. What is this lobe? Same. Upper, middle, lower. 
So you need the lateral view of the X-ray to know exactly where the upper lobe ends and where the lower lobe start, right? So what do you know here? The upper lobe is just upper, yes. In the middle lobe is just middle. Yes, but what is about? Also, in front, middle lobe is not only in between, but it's not sandwiched like three layers of sandwiches, one above, upper lobe, below, medium, below, below, that's the lobe it is. They are of light, they are superimposed on each other. On the lateral view, they separate from each other. Middle lobe is mainly and so if I'm going to listen to a patient in middle lobe pneumonia, what would I be listening? Upper part of the chest will be upper lobe, lower of the front will be middle lobe, and the lower lobe is not only below but behind, 100% behind. If you see anything on the lower lobe in front, you can argue and say this part, but you know, when you're going to listen to that, right? It gets very narrow, very thin. Most of the posterior examination of the patient is what do you all not have? Anybody knows this before coming here? You don't have cancer for the catcher? So remember, posterior examination, you are auscultating, percussing only to what? Lower lobe. Interior, upper part is upper lobe, right? Left, middle lobe, middle lobe. Can you remember this? Yes. Everyone? Yes. Everyone. Okay. All right. That's your upper lobe. Is above. And it goes from and back. But the middle lobe is all in front, and the lower lobe is all in the back. Clear? I wish I could spend a little time on it, but you can, I can share my lecture to all of you. Yes. Where the left lobe is the oblique fissure, the same same spot? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The oblique fissure of the left and right are same. Same. Okay. The same spot, same orientation, same disposition, it comes up like it. Except that the middle lobe is missing. So on the left side is on the upper lobe, right? Mm -hmm. You can call this part as the lingula, right? Arbitrary. Lord, Lord. Okay, I'm going to take three seconds or so. Anybody has a question? Clear? Lungs are clear? Fishers are clear? We'll be tested on this in a minute. <laughs> all right, so what I have, I have 14 minutes. Go with the question and take that answer and put it right No way, right? Try to not work. So I'll be the best at the end. Right? Okay, everyone, everyone pick up a piece of paper. I didn't have time to do this. Pick up a piece of paper. Pick up a piece of paper and write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten. Just write number ten. You can do it in notepad. I want to write Yes? Right? Is this abnormality? Is 
can see it, right? Not present on the left side. This is the abnormal density that we have already recognized. The normal chest x ray that should not be there. What is this? The CT scan of the same areas, right side, shows that. The diagnosis is number three. Try it on that. Which side is abnormal? You look at the PA view, right side looks white. And you see on the left hand view, which low? Write it down. Is the right sided abnormality confirmed on the lateral view to be lower or lower low, right? What is the abnormality? Right. I leave the fish as to let you know which low it is now. And that's the area of interest. So write down the low. This tells you it is right sided, and this tells you which low it is. Good. Move on. Number four. Little harder. So we can cover it in the syllabus, but let me see if any of you can get it. What does it show? To help you out, to help you out, I put this normal chest x I put in this normal chest x ray. Compare this. Compare this PA and lateral view to this PA and lateral view. Look at the size of heart, the lung, the diaphragm. Next one, number five. Which side is abnormal? Right side. What kind of density is there? Homogeneous. What kind of food water is there? It is concave water. Give it a name. Put it down. Write it down. Write it down. Good. Which side is abnormal? That one, in fairness, the light should be turned off, but so you can see which one is around. And what is the point? Good. Number seven, <laughs> what is the diagram? Which side is abnormal? <laughs> right side. Is the track here shifted towards the abnormal side or away from the abnormal side? Words. This was a spiny. What's the diagnosis? I didn't show it, so I tried to prepare and say I did not show it to you, but I'm expecting that giving me the clue that it's a right sided white out and the trachea is shifted to the right side. Gives you an idea. What causes the lung to shrink? Give it a diagnosis. This is what the midline should be. So the trachea is definitely shifted to the right side. What is the point? What is the abnormal? Right to left. Left or right? What is it called? What do you want to call it? What about this? <laughs> this time the left side is wide out. So the base is not here shifted to the Number 10. The most challenging question. Two parts. Where is the white tumor? Which side? Which low? Write it down. First, write down the white tumor. Call it a lung nodule. Call it a lung nodule. Which side is it? Which low? How about the red one? Which low? Got it? To pass this to okay, so question one right upper low pneumonia. Give yourself one point if you got it right. Give it 10 points. Okay, that's how it is because it takes the entire right upper low consolidation pneumonia involving 100% of the right upper What is it? Right upper low tumor because that's where the tumor is on the right side is rounded. Lobulated pneumonia will not go wrong generally. <coughs> right. So, right up on the tumor, most likely 29.9 percent lung cancer. Right? If you saw 10 points, you got that. Left lower of pneumonia, right lower of pneumonia. Sorry. It is in the lower part, and it is not the lower location. I showed you the lower location, right? 
and you can see the maintenance time. So it's really like a lot. Yes. Is it also in the left as well? No, the left one, you know, falls on each other, so we don't know. So you have to go back to why you setting there. Right. That would be a softer one. Okay. Be the same, but I would not call that over right. Fair? Fair. So you say right up, lower low, then that level might be easy. Do you not consider the middle piece? Right. The well, the hard water is not lost. Okay. Middle low will lose the hard water. Okay. If it was middle low, you will not see the right. I didn't cover that. I still have no slide, I took the right. Then what? Okay, so right now we have the agenda that we want to one, and that's over the spine. Question number four we are still being look at the shape of the diaphragm and look at the fair diaphragm. Look at the amount of fair you understand. Increase every diameter, red diaphragm, increase red external space, all including lung. So that's the gear CLB. Right, plural diffusion. We showed you one of the left, so you should have taken 100 percent to pick up that plural diffusion model. And then it's just some kind of complicated sign in that book. Right, name of the complete collapse of the right lung. Or is it? Right, at the left, this is the whole right lung is collapsed either from a tumor or a mucus part is not getting any air. When the lung does not get any air, it collapses. And the left lung makes up, it comes over. But we shift it just like the right lung is like this. Question Left upper low tumor, B. Left and left is B. Okay, the white tumor is B. Could be upper or lower because you have to look at the lateral. If you ask me, show me the lateral. Right. How about the rest of you? Could be upper or low. Right? The time to write the upper, look for Dr. Matai on the hallway. You have five minutes to summarize. Everybody, okay, now before you do that, how many of you got six out of ten right? Raise your hand. Which one? Eight. Eight. Upper or lower? Eight or nine? Upper or two? Nine or left lung at the left. Because left lung, like the right lung, left lung at the left. Anybody got 10 out of 10? But it is good to see that majority of the students were still in the passing part. So, that's good. All right. All right. So, we are going to move from this lecture now. Right now, we have to use this four minutes left. What did we learn? Test I did the test physical and surface landmark for common test procedure. Not just procedure, but also for physical diagnosis, right? We learned for the sake of time the anteriority you can identify the angles of duty or maneuver external angles, which is the second read, and we can calculate that second read and go beyond third read. We can align the best and the safest point to enter the chest to remove tension in the not more time in structure, it is two centuries old procedure. And at the same place, on the axilla, we say over the sixth read, we definitely line the hip, it will be the anterior insert chest tube to remove air, fluid, blood, pus, etc. We learn that on the posterior knee paracentesis, we enter. Typically, ninth read could be eight, could be ten on the scapular line to do paracentesis. So, three procedures are done, other than wrong. We pulmonary specialists do one in induction catheter, chest tube insertion, and paracentesis. So the three procedures and paracentesis may be a procedure they can using them. French, no. The acute care may do you do they do thoracentesis and chest tubes. The family we do not. Okay. All right. So also we identify. <laughs> this is the part I want everybody, whether you are acute care or not acute care. Okay. What am I doing? Which part of the lung? <laughs> You can go back and listen to the one of those who have said, you can go back and go back and learn the clinical diagnosis, etc. etc. All right, because now.
my normal chest x ray, I showed you some normal chest x ray, and the best chest x ray is here in left hand, and of course, they compromise due to follicle x ray in patients who cannot stand up. So, serenity, joining them, that's the patient, and looking at many of the post operation, etc. But we miss some things in the basis, behind the heart, in the sternum. We say that we understand the limitations of portable chest x ray, we just mentioned that. Identify the alarm lobes and vision. So, what are the name of the right side of lung lobe? I'm going to go. Your name? Tell me how many lobes you know the right side. Your name? Okay, then. Okay, let me tell you the reason for Upper and middle are the three lobes. The first feature is called major feature. Major. Or like. Divide the lung into. Upper and lower half, the upper half is further divided by a smaller line called minor fissure, which divides the upper part into upper and middle lobe. You try the left side. And it's name? Major fissure, and the lobes are called lower lobe. You can make lung more than the medical injury. All right, let's get the last one. We have some idea now how the pneumonia looks like, right? We've shown you a right upper lobe pneumonia, we've shown a right lower lobe pneumonia, sometimes there will be a right upper lobe and left lower lobe, multiple lobe pneumonia. We've got an idea how to at least have an introduction to recognize pneumonia, right? We also gave you some picture to recognize one tumor. I've like showed you a mass in the upper lobe and lower lobe, they can be the middle and lower lobe, but something is very more common in the upper lobe. So I showed you the upper lobe. We showed the COPD and so many of you got it. And here I got impression flat. It press diaphragm, increase the feet diameter, increase space behind the sternum and front of the heart, etc. Right? Pure diffusion. What's the type of pure diffusion? Homogeneous density that seems to layer laterally with the concave line. The concave line is called meniscus. Lung with the meniscus sign in the nipple. That's the posh. Meniscus. N U N I S C. Meniscus sign. We don't have a pneumothorax. What do we learn about pneumothorax?
But what did you learn about in your module, your respiratory, your lower respiratory module, and then health assessment about spirometry? We, we use it to, to assess the, the tidal volume and, and use that to then diagnose certain lung disorders um, and asthma, COPD, disease. Yeah. So, have you had any formal instruction on the All right. Good. Not good. Good. Okay. Good. 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 So, I went to medical school in India. I graduated in 87. So, for about 32 years, I've been doing great. I started looking at PFDs in my physiology lecture. What was that? 1982. Some of you probably were not wrong. So, what I'm trying to tell you here is even now, when I read a textbook or a chapter or an article on PFDs, I understand some nuances. So, that's why I call this lecture an introduction to PFDs. So, if you guys learn three things today, that's good enough. Okay? So, I'm curious. So, how do you diagnose obstruction? How do you diagnose restriction? How do you diagnose some of the other conditions? So in fact, I tell my 